The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Personalizing Bladder Cancer Care in the Modern Therapeutic Era. One size no longer fits all. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash YEM 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Welcome to our session here with a wonderful friend and great colleague, Dr. Neil Shore. We're both excited to see you. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Neil here. Uh, he's going to discuss the very important topic of addressing unmet needs in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer with innovative therapeutic solutions. And then we're going to uh, do this together. Uh, Neil will start with reshaping the treatment algorithms for muscle invasive bladder cancer, focusing on the bladder sparing options, bladder preservation, and uh, I will follow up with systemic therapy options, and I will finish off the session with a didactic of recent progress and current status of therapies in metastatic disease. So without further ado, my honor and pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. Neil Sor. You all know Neil, you have this no introduction. He's the medical director in the Carolina Urologic Research Center. He's a chief medical officer in the Urology and Surgical Oncology in Genesis Care, US, Middle Beach, South Carolina, and really a remarkable colleague, individual. Neil, thank you for being here. Well, Petros, uh, thank you so much. I, I think, as you said, I mean, there really has been a revolution. And uh, starting around 2016 uh, with the first I.O. approvals, uh, and have we, we've seen the indications move more and more proximally. We're going to talk about that today. And, and bringing in the full uh, multidisciplinary team of urology and medical oncology, radiation oncology to work together, uh, it, I think it's just tremendous. W our topics today as we've, you've outlined, NMIBC, uh, trimodal bladder sparing, and then uh, neoadjuvant, adjuvant strategies, we really have the luxury of having an embarrassment of riches. And I think that's one of the things that I'm so excited about. I mean, to continue to have the intellectual vigor that we have in the clinic and in research is, is quite remarkable. Um, NMIBC, uh, everyone is familiar with uh, the, 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 the decades and decades of great opportunity with BCG. We know that NMIBC is a heterogeneous disease. Uh, we have high, high risk, uh, low risk disease. We have uh, strategies and decision making that we have to think about. We now oftentimes have uh, supply chain shortages, whether it's with BCG, that varies depending upon where you are in the US, even where you are in the world. Uh, we have chemotherapeutics that we can uh, also uh, employ, uh, both for patients who are at high risk versus low risk. We have pathology changes as to how we grade histopathology and how we think about it. And I think very ex in exciting is all of the new NMIBC opportunities in addition to having BCG as a relative standard of care, intravesical chemotherapies. And what we're gonna talk about now is so many of the advancing a, a pipeline of a pending approvals. So I, I, this is a, a, is a really great work, the IBCG, you know, and its international input. And, and one of the things that we see here is these definitions that have evolved over time is what defines adequate BCG? Of course, we're familiar with patients who have less than adequate, and now that becomes its own interesting category how do we design trials for the less than adequate BCG? How do we think about intravesical chemotherapy uh, as a standard of, or a comparator arm for low risk, intermediate risk? Intermediate risk is a, a, a large uh, unmet opportunity for uh, trial design. And then of course, you know, what defines BCG unresponsive? Recently, there's been a really great workshop that happened at uh, the bladder cancer think tank this year, where we heard the FDA said, you know, once BCG unresponsive, always BCG unresponsive. So it's important for all of us to be aware of this, uh, this landscape and how we can think about uh, trial design and definitions. Um, here's a nice overview from both AUA and SUO, and SUO has clearly been at the forefront. The Clinical Trials Consortium, tremendous work that's been done. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But when it comes to our daily practice, academic or community, US or global, we have all these patients who come in regularly. There's no shortage of patients with bladder tumors. We do our TURBTs. We def define whether or not they appear to be low or intermediate risk. 
Uh, hopefully, they're getting um, post-TURBT gemcitabine based upon tremendous work that's demonstrated that value proposition, but we know that that doesn't always happen for various reasons. And then ultimately, are the patients considered based upon histopathology, low, intermediate, or high risk? And where do we ultimately position uh, induction BCG, uh, maintenance BCG, and what about the patients who can't get BCG and intravesical options and trial options? So there's a lot of um, uh, opportunity for intravesical chemotherapy before I get onto this slide. And, and so it's interesting to me that we had mitomycin in the US. A recent uh, market analysis we did shows that within the community, there's a tremendous amount of single use gemcitabine in academic centers. There's a much greater um, utilization of gem dosi. Mitomycin is really pushed down. And it's an interesting phenomenon. Is it related to complications of therapy? Is it an acquisition? Uh, there is always access considerations, economic, but I think it's very interesting to see where the community in the U.S. is going in terms of intravesical chemotherapy. But transitioning just for a second now over to checkpoint inhibitors. Um, I think this is really a, a going to be a very exciting year in the world of BCG and naive patients who are at high-risk disease. Uh, this phase three trial um, uh, sponsored uh, by um, AstraZeneca, the Potomac trial. I'm honored to be a co-PI on this with Maria DeSantis, a medical oncologist uh, from Germany. And this will almost assuredly have a readout sometime in 2023. Uh, you can see the stratification, the inclusion. And this is the, the, the first major trial that will read out the use of a checkpoint inhibitor, uh, Dervalumab, uh, with the various arms that you see here, induction only BCG, maintenance, induction maintenance, um, as well as um, just a standard of care, um, uh, the five plus two, and then maintenance over the course of a two year period. At the very bottom of this slide, there are other really important trials that are very similar, almost identical trial designs. Uh, the Keynote 76, 676, which is um, uh, Merck sponsored and the Crest um, uh, sasanelumab, which is interestingly a subcutaneous uh, administration of an IO. And so these are all global phase three trials that will have readouts, and this will, uh, if they're positive, will assuredly uh, change the way we think about BCG naive high risk patients. And we can talk more about that. Importantly, you see the phase two down here that's uh, the Sunrise One, the ADAPT bladder. Um, the Sunrise One is, 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 is a fascinating use of a device uh, that essentially has a, a, a osmotic pump. Some folks call this the pretzel because it looks like a pretzel. It's about the size of two quarters that goes in the bladder and delivers intravesical gemcitabine in the TAR-200. And that's in combination with uh, the, the, uh, the Janssen-sponsored study of uh, citrilamab, their checkpoint inhibitor. The ADAPT bladder is looking at a multi-cohort with Dervalumab as well. So this area of IO entering into the urologic arena, certainly in combination with our medical oncology colleagues, is, is, is very important. Now, uh, that was the BCG naive. Now, what about the unresponsive? And I, th this is not an exhaustive chart here, but it, you, you can, we could spend an hour just talking about this. We can go around this wheel for our BCG unresponsive NMIBC patients. And one of the challenges is we know this is the particular group that's at very significant risk, not only for recurrence, but of a much higher likelihood for developing progression. And the progression um, biologic um, a transition results in uh, potentially a more aggressive therapy, including for a radical cystectomy. So uh, we, I've already mentioned the IO at the top. We have FGFR inhibitors, both oral as well as through that same pretzel device, the TAR-200 model that Janssen has. Um, the area to the bottom um, or right of the screen uh, the um, at Stiladrin, thanks to the SUO Clinical Trials Consortium, Steve Bajorin, Colin Dinney, uh, many, almost everyone here, was really one of the landmark accomplishments of the SUO CTC to achieve this extremely important study. And I be do believe that this is now in front of the FDA, and hopefully this will um, uh, we'll see at Stiladrin come into the market. 
Uh, likewise, across from that is the IL interleukin 15, the super agonist uh, for the, the ALT-803 from the QUILT trial. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but this is another example of BCG unresponsive patients having additional opportunities. Um, moving down to the bottom here, we see there are many other alternative delivery options. There are a whole series of early phase studies looking at ablative strategies and tumor uh, apoptotic effects that are really, really exciting. I'm sure many of those in the audience are involved in those. Towards the bottom, the oncolytic adenoviruses, whether it's the cold genesis um, uh, uh, product of, of multiple trials, uh, Vaxion, multiple other companies. This is a very exciting area of u utilizing combination viral uh, vectors with uh, immunoadjuvants that can uh, enhance apoptotic effects with a mechanism of action that is not similar necessarily to BCG, and you can't have a, a meeting with urologists and immuno-oncologists uh, uh, and not recognize that we've been in the immuno-oncologic arena with, um, with BCG now for several decades. So this is just a quick review, the, the, the Keynote 57. This was a, a, a really important and, and, and major study that led to the first approval of an IO therapy, a checkpoint inhibitor for a BCG unresponsive CIS. The CR rate, as you see here, 40% at three months. And, and this had durability and ultimately led to uh, approval by the FDA and coverage by CMS. Extended uh, monitoring, so one sees the, at the very bottom here, uh, the, the tolerability, the immune-related adverse events, not atypical from what had been seen earlier with pembrolizumab, uh, but this is certainly an area for urologists that are continuing to have to learn how to recognize, educate patients. But this opens up an opportunity for patients to consider therapy, BCG unresponsive CIS, who would prefer to avoid cystectomy. Uh, I mentioned the QUILT trial, remarkable results. Um, and if you look at the CR here at three months, 71% CR. Uh, and this is looking at um, the N803. This is a really the mechanism of action, more complicated than just saying it has an, an effect, on, uh, a positive impact on natural killer and T cells, augmenting the immunologic response, being studied in other uh, cancer types besides prostate, uh, besides bladder cancer. Uh, but ultimately, one sees the, um, the efficacy summary of cohort A, and the safety and tolerability was actually quite remarkable for a, a purely intravesical um, therapy in combination with BCG. I mentioned the, the phase three on uh, at Stiladrin. Prior, we called it Instiladrin, but natopharagene feridinovic. Um, we published this in Lancet Oncology. Uh, we published our earlier phase two in JCO. And again, this is really a tremendous work that was accomplished by the SUOCTC. And I think this is in front of the FDA and then hopefully um, having the, a correction in some recent manufacturing issues will, uh, uh, I'm optimistic that we'll see this uh, uh, in, in the clinic in 2023. So uh, I mentioned earlier, there are some other things on the horizon. It's, this is as, as if this wasn't enough. Uh, FGFR inhibition, I think Petros is going to talk about it, and it led to the first approval of oral, oral ertafitinib, its third line in um, advanced uh, metastatic urethral carcinoma. But what we know is the avidity and the, pr and the uh, prevalence of FGFR receptors is even higher in the NMIBC uh, arena. So this is a great area that's being studied both with oral and device um, uh, uh, deliveries. And again, that kind of really fits into the urology wheelhouse. Um, we have, I mentioned earlier, the, the, the early cutting edge work that's being performed by Cold Genesis. Uh, it's an adenovirus and an oncolytic vaccine. And then at the very bottom here, we see uh, other applications, intravesical, for example, um, the use of the, uh, the reversible temperature devices known as the, uh, the, um, the Vestigel. They have approval in upper tract disease, uh, but they're looking at it as well, and also ad additional formulations that combine that with uh, toll-like receptor inhibitors.
So um, with that, um, I, you know, it's sort of a, an interesting, as I said, it's a, it's a whirlwind of so many opportunities for our, our fellows and, and residents and, and trialists, but also most importantly to advance the clinical armamentarium for patients. It's because at the end of the day, if you have high-risk NMIBC, you want to keep it, you want to prevent progression and avoid it. Uh, surgical intervention as much as we all enjoy operating as, as urologic surgical oncologists. So here's a case, a uh, 65-year-old patient, um, you know, uh, very, it could be a male, could be a, a, a female, but here we have, yes, a resection, high-grade disease, per guidelines gets a, a repeat resection, there's no residual tumor, uh, and so what are the opportunities? If the patient were BCG naive, if one could argue if he were BCG uh, unresponsive. And, and how do we think about intravesical versus parenteral and systemic approaches? Ultimately, how do we deliver this? How do we work best with our colleagues uh, in medical oncology? How do we think about the implementation and the throughput? And of course, the heterogeneity of bladder cancer mirrors the heterogeneity as to how we practice um, uh, healthcare in, in this country and every other country in the world. And how do we talk to our patients about their risk-benefit analyses for doing these treatments? Uh, Petros, maybe your comment, and then we can go forward, but your thoughts on a case like this. <coughs> Neil, you uh, did a fantastic job outlining all these amazing data sets. I think, you know, the best we have right now in BCG naive population, until the trials read out, you mentioned the Potomac, the CRESH trials, is intravesical BCG for, for high-grade disease, T1. So I think it's a discussion, of course, with colleagues like you, experts like you with urology, you know, the TGRBT repeat was done, which is very, very important because the risk of understaging is very high, can be up to 50%, especially if you lack muscularized propria, about 20% if you have muscularized propria. So I think it depends on the, on the risk stratification. If there is no any very high risk factors to make you discuss the option of radical cystectomy, I think most, case, most patients will probably get intravesical BCG. The question is how do you deal with a national BCG shortage, which is a manufacturing issue? Uh, do you go with a classical, in the classical induction, of course, and in, in you know, six weekly doses, repeat, of course, evaluation in the bladder, and then if there's no uh, persistent T1, that will be an indication of radical cystectomy at, at exactly after induction, you can continue with maintenance. And then, you know, based on the short trial, ideally, if you have BCG available, you go with a three years maintenance uh, 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 schedule of BCG. The question is how do you manage BCG shortage, of course. Yeah, I, I would agree with all that. Any issues with the shortage at your side or you have adequate for now? You know, we've been really fortunate and I just find it really rather fascinating. Um, we have not had a shortage, but you know, we were really good at prioritizing not overutilizing in low risk patients. And um, you know, there's the occasional intermediate risk, but we've been actually very fortunate. We've always um, had good uh, upfront education on patient expectations and, 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 and strategies so that we had very few BCG intolerant patients, sure. short of those who had really poorly compliant bladders. So I think the way that the, uh, the allocation was done was based on volume. So we were always very high volume, and so we've been very lucky. And sure. I, uh, but, I, uh, but I empathize for many of other of uh, colleagues who don't have that. Thank you. Uh, so let's go to the, my, my second segment here. And, and this is an area that I'm actually you know, very passionate about because um, you know, uh, RC, radical cystectomy, done well with an extended node dissection is a tremendous life-saving operation, no doubt about it. But uh, I think the, the surveys always demonstrate that patients, if given their druthers, and if they have a really, just really crippled bladder, would much rather maintain their bladders. And from an RVU standpoint, we see that a radical cystectomy and an extended node dissection, I think, is, is the, one of the highest RVU allocations you could conceivably have. It's a very significant, technically challenging procedure that, uh, that thanks to the SUO and leadership, the work is done and the teaching has, has led to much greater um, uh, uh, um, expertise throughout you know, this, you know, the U.S. and throughout the world. But uh, uh, really, even the appropriate TRBT is, is something that can't be taken for granted. And so what ultimately happens in the trimodal bladder sparing, and great work done by Jason Estathiou and, and Bill Shipley up at, 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 in, in Massachusetts, and. Uh, other parts in, in uh, the, the, the world, UK and, and Utah and others, have really started to pioneer this notion around uh, 
Can we do bladder sparing, trimodal uh, uh, chemoradiation, concurrent chemoradiation, and allow for bladder preservation? And you can see the algorithm here. If you have a complete response, you move forward, you have long-term surveillance. And these patients, and at least in my experience, are remarkably happy to have gone through this and maintain adequate, good quality bladder function. Um, of course, if there's an incomplete response, then th these patients have to be followed very vigilantly for a potential salvage cystectomy. So what about some of the trials that are out there right now? So uh, it still, I think, is the minority of, of locations that are comfortable not moving right to radical cystectomy. So here's the, the Keynote 992. This is an ongoing accruing trial. And these are for patients who have uh, T2 to T4, obviously no metastatic disease. They want bladder preservation. They're chemo eligible. They don't have Golsky uh, criteria issues. Uh, and then you see the randomization of um, chemo radiation plus Pembro versus chemo radiation and placebo uh, infusion. And this is actively accruing. Uh, and I think that this is really this opportunity to combine multiple mechanisms of action in patients who have particularly anatomically acceptable locations of their malignancy, I do think it's really important that a very aggressive TURBT from optimal maximal debulking uh, is, is completed. Uh, there are other uh, examples of this. This is another a really important study, 475 patients. Similar inclusion criteria. Um, a, on concurrent chemoradiation, and there are various choices that our medical oncology colleagues can choose. There's typically three to five that are offered. Some are a little bit different depending upon where you are in the world, but ultimately this trial, like the uh, 992 keynote, is chemoradiation therapy plus adding uh, a checkpoint inhibitor, uh, atezolizumab. Now, interestingly, and unfortunately, we just heard this week that they dropped their, um, their, their first-line um, indication for atezolizumab. Kind of um, ironic and sad, as they were the first uh, indication, and they had that um, sort of a, a conditional approval. But nonetheless, they're still, uh, uh, Genentech Roche is still investigating. Uh, I mentioned earlier the use of the pretzel technology. Interestingly, that started with the use of lidocaine for IC patients, and I was fortunate to be part of that, but this TAR-200 is remarkable. You see the pretzel in the cartoon at the bottom, and it literally is the size of about two quarters. It is sublime, sublimely easy to insert and remove, So, and it can be done in the clinic. There's no need for any kind of uh, um, IV sedation or general anesthesia, and the patients tolerate this remarkably well. I find uh, better than e even having an indwelling double J stent. Uh, but what's really kind of remarkable is the ability to allow for this uh, uh, osmotic pump delivery over time. Now, gemcitabine has, is, is, the, is part of the Sunrise platform, and there are four trials. There's the Sunrise 1, 2, 3, and 4. This phase 3 trial, as you can see here, is for patients who are looking for bladder preservation for all the reasons that we've already articulated. And there's a randomization one-to-one. -one. Again, their uh, proprietary checkpoint inhibitor citrilamab um, versus the uh, installation of the TAR-200 with gemcitabine on a Q3 weekly basis. So you're really sort of combining intravesical direct uh, urothelial mucosal uh, application of a well-described drug, gemcitabine, clearly has efficacy, uh, as well as a systemic therapy. And so there, there's um, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunity here in, in combinations to further allow for bladder sparing. Uh, here's another uh, example of, this is uh, um, uh, AstraZeneca combining, uh, this is a phase two study, but combining not only a PD blocker, but a CTLA-4. And we've seen the incredible success of that in metastatic uh, 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 renal cell carcinoma and other uh, cancer types. And so why not look at it here as well, again, with the hope of uh, uh, allowing for uh, bladder conservation. Um, so this is a Duravitremi combination. Um, and then going on leading into uh, radiation therapy uh, and and uh, depending upon w uh, the extent of that, depending upon nodal involvement or nodal, uh, uh, just really just within the, the pelvis. Uh, 
And then, of course, all of these trials require very, very rigorous vigilant follow-up with endoscopy and, 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 and biomarkers, typically in the form of cytology. Um, and here's another really interesting study, and this was uh, uh, Matt Galski has been pioneering this. This comes from the Hoosier Cancer Research Network, the GU16257. What I like about this is that they're really now trying to get into this notion of, around uh, genomic profiling. And so this recent work has come out demonstrating that you may find upwards of 4% of patients having uh, homologous recombinant repair alterations. We're all familiar with that landscape in prostate cancer and breast and ovarian and pancreatic. And I think this is a great opportunity in bladder cancer to try and see, as you can see here, really, isn't it interesting that these patients got a gemcyst plus a nivolumab. They underwent their, their sequencing um, which I've been doing for quite a long time, even though I know it's not in the guidelines right now for bladder cancer, but I like it because I want to understand not only FGFR avidity, I also want to understand a, a tumor mutational burden. Uh, I still like to understand what the, the PDL status is as well. But interestingly, for the patients who had CRs, uh, you know, 30 out of the 31, you know, went on to no cystectomy. So that kind of tells you a lot about what patients desire and then going on with a, a maintenance nivolumab. The swimmer's plot to the right, is it's still, these patients are continuing to be followed, but I guess what I find particularly compelling about this trial is not only are we looking at bladder preservation, but we're also getting ourselves into that important mindset of a genomic profiling in bladder cancer. Uh, and um, you know, if we had time, we're, we're doing more and more of that in, in kidney cancer, keeping it in our GU realm uh, for uro-oncologists. So here's our in a, a second case. Um, we have a 64-year-old uh, man. He's a good performance status. And of course, so many of our patients who come to us with muscle-invasive bladder cancer and even non-muscle-invasive, they Depending upon where you practice, they tend to be a little bit more on the elderly side, not always, but oftentimes they do have performance status issues, smoking, uh, alcohol use, uh, possibly uh, environmental toxicities. Maybe they were working in, in factories, petrochemical exposure, et cetera. But nonetheless, um, there is heterogeneity and some patients just have the misfortune and po possibly this is biological and genetic. So um, he gets a, a TURBT, he's T2, he's uh, based upon his evaluation, uh, presumably a, a CT scan. We can talk about other imaging modalities, but there's no signs of disease outside the bladder. He's got reasonable uh, GFR and, cl and clearance, typical cardiovascular, and he doesn't have issues of neuropathy or hearing loss, which would preclude him from uh, having um, uh, uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. So I guess what I haven't put in here to this is, you know, what's the location of the tumor and how aggressive can we be? Um, you know, are there predisposing exclusions for trimodal, trimodal bladder sparing? You know, is the tumor too close to the ureteral orifice, pre-existing hydroureter, uh, uh, you know, so um, Petros, you probably are getting all, more and more of these at Tumor Board, and, and, and how, do you, how do you approach it? Neil, again, fantastic presentation. I, I think this is a great case for our multidisciplinary bladder cancer clinic. We have this at the University of Washington every Tuesday morning, and we have patients like this and, and, and even more complicated. And the question here is, as you mentioned, are there any particular factors that may make us think more or less about bladder preservation. You already alluded to, you know, the presence of the tumor, you know, near the ureteral orifice, obstruction with other nephrosis, extensive diffuse carcinoma in situ, a very, I would say, crippled, quote unquote, bladder with, you know, a very poor bladder capacity and a lot of bladder symptoms. Those may be factors to make us think more about surgery, radical cystectomy, a pelvic no dissection. On the other side, uh, if in the absence of those factors, I think a patient uh, like this, especially with smaller tumors, uh, solitary tumors, T2 or T3A may be great candidates for bladder preservation. And I think we should discuss with the patient and give them an equal balanced, thoughtful discussion about uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, splatting-based combination, dosedensenvac or gemcis for cycles, followed by radical surgery, 
or bladder preservation, and I think that's a very fair point. And I think the message to the audience is, please do discuss discuss uh, this option of bladder preservation. And you alluded to already, Neil, very quickly, the three radiosensitizing chemotherapy options in those patients that we use is either cisplatin alone once a week for cisplatin fit patients, or 5 of unomatomycin C. There was a paper from Nick James in UK, 2012, the uh, BC 2001 trial, and orgemcitabine alone is the third option, either once or twice a week. So that's great. Got, got a few questions here. We got a little bit of time before we get to your segment, so we're doing good there. Uh, how to best coordinate between urology and oncology when managing a patient with progressive disease? So, you know, it seems so basic, and uh, I was talking to a, a friend of mine right before the program, but it wasn't always so basic, and there was really these, these, these uh, I think, unnecessary demarcations, uh, uh, or town and gown, internecine warfare within specializations, and I think that you know, that should all be yesteryear conversation. What's in the best interest of patients, whether it's getting a systemic therapy that can have uh, grade three, four toxicities, but he or she is amenable to it, having that full-throated shared decision-making conversation, but making sure that you have a really active, ongoing collaboration with, as a urologist, since we're at the SUO, with your medical oncologist or a uro-oncologist within your practice, who is really dedicated to this, because it's, it's not the easiest thing, and also your radiation oncology Absolutely. colleagues. And then the patients, you know, fully, fully armed uh, can make the best decision. Um, Petros, your, has, has your experience evolved over time since, you, I know you just finished residency like six <laughs> months ago, but. Less than that. <laughs> I always, thank you, thank you, Neil. Uh, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. I think it's a, the, the key is multidisciplinary discussion, and. It's my favorite clinic, right? Uh, every Tuesday morning when we have this, we have urologic oncology, medical oncology, radiation oncology, pathologists and radiologists yeah. in the same room. The trainee sees the patient 8 to 9 a.m. and then we have a tumor board 9 to 10. It's a resource intense setting, but the patients love it, patient-centered. And yes, my, my thought process has evolved over time. Uh, I'm definitely more open to the bladder preservation as you mentioned before. We do not have a phase three trial comparing radical surgery with bladder preservation, but I think with proper patient selection, the outcomes at least yeah. look similar and comparable. Yeah, it's really interesting that you mentioned that. I think that's, that's a great trial. We'd like to see it. That'll be a very hard trial to do. For sure. Because patients will say, well, wait a minute. I got randomized to the RC. I'm, I'm out of the study. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go and do this otherwise. There that's been my experience. But, uh, but thanks, Petro. So uh, let me hand it over to you. Neil, fantastic job. And just to add one more thing, you know, for, for bladder preservation, as Neil alluded to, maximum TURBT is very important, complete resection of the tumor as possible. Of course, try to avoid perforation. Uh, but this is a key thing before concurrent chemo radiation. And now we have trials like the SOC Energy 1806, you know, that we evaluate the role of immunotherapy, which is still experimental in bladder preservation setting for now. So we have uh, a lot of discussion about reshaping, reshaping the treatment algorithms for muscle invasive disease. And I'm going to uh, briefly re uh, review you know, what has changed in the last few decades, answering Neil's question, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. I think it was a really long effort, and SGO has done a great job, you know, trying to you know, uh, discuss the data. And the data and the level one evidence strongly supports that neoadjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy is a standard of care for muscle invasive bladder cancer T2, T3, or T4 resectable disease, and we have two options. We have either the dose-dense MVAC with growth factor support, all drugs are given one after the other on day one, given every two weeks. This is different than what you see in that slide. That slide is comparing the classical, older, conventional MVAC that was given on 28-day cycle, much more elaborate, more toxicity. This has been replaced now by the dose-dense MVAC with growth factor support. It's shorter durations, about six weeks, because you're given you know, every two weeks for four uh, doses. The other option is themselves and cisplatin, and it's interesting, we, we never had a neoadjuvant phase three trial with gemcis versus radical stectomy alone. However, gemcis has, um, uh, I would say, been used for a long time. Uh, and we have now a couple of trials comparing gemcis versus dose dense and vac. One is called SWOG 1314, the other is called the VESPER trial. Um, a lot of discussion there, but I will just say either regimen is reasonable. My slight preference in fit patients who can get it, I try to use dose dense and vac with growth factor support for four cycles. Uh, but gemcis is a reasonable alternative, again, for neoadjuvant chemotherapy in fit patients, of course. Of course, the question is, 
Oh, not all the patients are fit for cisplatin. Uh, Dr. Galski in Mount Sinai and colleagues, about 11 years ago, they published in JCO the famous Galski criteria, and they asked oncologists in a consensus-based approach, how do you feel about giving cisplatin? What are the criteria in your clinic that make you uh, more or less likely to give cisplatin? And this came up to be performance status, kidney function, uh, absence of significant neuropathy, absence of significant hearing loss, and absence of symptomatic heart failure, ECOG PS 0 to 1, and creatinine clearance 60 or higher. Now, of course, you know, there can be discussion about the hearing function with the patient, a little bit subjective. Some patients may tolerate a little bit, long, a little bit high frequency loss. Creatinine clearance cutoff threshold is also variable among medical oncologists. The point is that patients can get, some patients can get cisplatin, cisplatin eligible patients. And on the right side, you see a, a number of, of clinical trials try to improve upon the backbone of chemotherapy, right? So you have, as I mentioned, those and some or GEMCs, and those trials, Energize, Niagara, Kinot 866, and Kinot B15, are trying to build upon that. And we have the GEMCs, plus minus Nivo, plus minus Durvalumab, or plus minus uh, Pembrolizumab, uh, and we have a promising combination, Pembrolizumab plus and Fortumab. All those are in clinical trial phase three stage. As of today, the role of checkpoint inhibitor remains experimental. So outside the context of a clinical trial, I'm not using checkpoint inhibitor in the new adjuvant setting. We'll talk about adjuvant in a second. About half of our patients are not fit for cisplatin based on the GALSI criteria, as I mentioned before, or a variation of those. And for those patients, you know, the options are either go straight to surgery, a radical cystectomy, lymph node dissection, or as Neil mentioned a minute ago, bladder preservation, which by the way can be an option also for cisplatin eligible patients. Think about that all the time in properly fit patients. And the other option is clinical trial, which is my favorite two words, clinical trials. In the morning, wake up in the morning. So we have a number of trials in this setting, cisplatin ineligible patients. We have the Kinot 905, Pembro Plus EV, uh, Dr. Sumpav, this ligand trial with ATSWOG 2011, Jamcarbo Plus Avelumab, and uh, we have the Volga trial, very interesting with uh, Durvalumab and Tremelimumab, anti pd one anti cd four. Uh, plus and fortum of adotin being evaluated for cisplatin ineligible patients. As I mentioned, these phase three trials need to be accrued. Hopefully, we'll have results in the future. And all those phase three trials are supported by very promising phase two trial data. Blast one by Dr. Gupta and, and, and many other trials uh, you see in that slide that look at combination of GEMCs plus a checkpoint inhibitor. Bottom line, very promising data supporting phase three trials. However, as of today, if you ask me, I'm not using a checkpoint inhibitor during the pure neoadjuvant setting. I'm waiting for the phase three trials to read out, but the data I'm seeing uh, uh, here make me very enthusiastic for the future. And a shout out for Dr. Gupta's BLAST1 uh, uh, genomic correlate analysis. Interesting biomarker work uh, here at, uh, it's actually today at 1 p.m. You want to see her, uh, her abstract. Now moving to the adjuvant setting. Let's say a patient gets a radical cystectomy, pelvic lymph node dissection, uh, which is always very important. What are the data with adjuvant immune checkpoint inhibitor? We talked about the new adjuvant checkpoint inhibitors, experimental, very promising phase three trials. However, in the adjuvant setting, we have a checkpoint inhibitor approved already, and that's nivolumab. There have been uh, three trials designed. Two of them have showed results. I'll go through the trials with you. In Vigor 010, Atiso versus observation, checkmate 274, Nivo versus placebo, different control arm there and ambassador Pembro versus observation. And here is the, the Invigor 010. This was overall a negative trial, meaning the adjuvant atezolizumab did not prolong disease-free survival or overall survival in the adjuvant setting. Uh, and there was an interesting work. This was published already uh, by uh, our team. Dr. Hussein presented the data at ASCO 2020. So negative trial uh, with adjuvant atezo. However, you can learn a lot, right? When you lose a game in soccer, the World Cup now, you can learn a lot, right? And, and you want to learn from a negative trial. So in that case, we did a lot of work with Tom Powell's and colleagues. We published this in Nature. And what you see in the slide on the left part of the slide, you see a putative prognostic role of circulating tumor DNA. So that's something that right now I think is very promising. And, and it's an emerging biomarker. Personally, I'm not using it yet in clinical practice in the new adjuvant or adjuvant setting, but I think it's coming. If you ask me what's the most promising biomarker in bladder cancer, I would say CDDNA. So we're getting there in the future, and what this slide shows, CDDNA detectability, positive status, portends a shorter survival. So if you are CDDNA positive after cystectomy, higher chance of recurrence, shorter survival, 
compared to their negative status. On the right slide is the, is the question, the premise or promise of predictive role. Does the presence of positive cDNA predict benefit with adjuvant atezolizumab? And that's the hypothesis in that exploratory analysis from that trial. We saw and we published this in Nature with Tom and others that if you have a detectable cDNA, you may benefit from atezo. If you have cDNA negative, you do not. This was an exploratory analysis. That's why I'm not using it yet in clinical practice, but actually has uh, led to the uh, conduction of uh, what you see in the left lower corner, the blue box, in Vigo 011, atezo versus placebo, only in cDNA positive patients. So you select the patients based on the DNA, and these patients get randomized to a TISO or placebo. And the similar trial in Denmark called Tombola trial, uh, they take patients cDNA positive, get a TISO, cDNA negative, um, uh, they don't. So with these trials are going to evaluate whether it's clinically useful or not to use cDNA. So something promising, in my opinion, we still need more data, and those trials will show those data. Having said that, we have an FDA approval in the US as of August 2021 that's adjuvant nivolumab, anti PD1. What is the data uh, uh, behind that? The Checkmate 274 trial. These are patients who may or not have received neoadjuvant cisplatin based chemotherapy. They come to the clinic, and if they had prior neoadjuvant chemo, they have a PT2 or higher states. If they never had neoadjuvant chemo, is PT3 or higher states, or not positive disease. And in that slide, you see on the left the disease-free survival uh, uh, in the overall population, in 10 to 3 population, ITT, that showed overall uh, signal, uh, uh, it shows disease-free survival benefit, has a ratio of 0.7. On the right is a PT1 positive, 1% uh, or higher, even a uh, higher difference, has a ratio of 0.53. We have not yet seen overall survival data. We're still waiting to see that, but based on the data you see in that slide, the FDA and, of course, many patient advocacy groups agree with that. They uh, approved uh, adjuvant nivolumab in the adjuvant setting for patients with high-risk urothelial cancer. That includes upper tract disease, although the uh, uh, subset there was small, smaller, let's say, uh, but the approval exists for both bladder and upper tract. And uh, as I mentioned, this was based on DFS data in the overall population. So what you see on the left, the ITT, is what FDA approved. What you see on the right, the PD1 high is only what happens in Europe. So EMA approved it only for PD1 high patients. In US, is approved for all patients, regardless of PD1 expression. Toxicity data important to discuss with the patient. I'll focus your attention on their uh, second column, nivolumab. You see that it's about 18.18% of grade three or higher treatment-related adverse events. Uh, think about uh, uh, you know skin itching, uh, uh, skin rash, fatigue thyroid changes, diarrhea, rash, and think about overall immune-related adverse events. It's very important to have experienced nurses, advanced drugs providers, and uh, colleagues, either urologists or medical oncologists, either way, but has to be, someone has to be trained in order to be able to follow the space and educate them and diagnose and manage early uh, immune-related adverse events across the board with immunotherapy, not only in that particular trial. The control arm was placebo, as I mentioned. Very quick word, uh, there was some uh, data published that the, in this disease-free survival benefit with Adjuvanivo uh, was associated with no detriment in quality of life. So those patients had prolonged disease survival. The median difference was about 11 months or so, and there was no deterioration in quality of life because the treatment was overall well tolerated for most patients. So let's go to a case here. So we have a 69-year-old lady uh, uh, that had evaluation for hematuria, uh, showed the sessile mass in the bladder, and uh, this was uh, resected and showed muscle invasive disease. Good kidney function, denies neuropathy, hearing loss, heart failure. Again, the GALSI criteria come to play here. Excellent performance status, underwent uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy with GEMSYS, we talked about that before, uh, followed by radical surgery, and had a new bladder, it was fit for new bladder based on kidney function in other regions. The pathology came back, despite the, the proper use of neoadjuvant GEMSYS here, uh, the patient had a T3A, so microscopically nil disease, the tumor went out of the bladder. Uh, uh, historically, the standard of care has been observation. We have no good data about giving more chemo. We gave it already, right? This was kind of platinum refractory, in my opinion, uh, <coughs> but you had to give neoadjuvant chemo. You have no good biomarker to know a priori. So right now, based on the checkmate 274, I just showed you the slides, adjuvant volume is an option. And uh, any comments, Neil, do you discuss it with the patients? 
Yeah, absolutely. So that was, that was really great, um, Petros. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, so here's this relatively healthy woman. She's gotten through her surgery well. She's had um, neoadjuvant standard of care platinum-based therapy, but yet her pathology is aggressive and concerning. So then she comes back to the clinic and says, okay, am I cured? Am I done? Is this it? And I think here's this really important discussion to say, well, we can offer you this systemic therapy, which you know, 80 plus percent of patients tolerate remarkably well. There are the grade three, four IRAEs, but I think as long as there is really uh, important discussion regarding these itises that can happen in virtually any part of the body, we typically see the more foremost common with maybe, you know, uh, colitis, dermatitis, pneumonitis, some thyroiditis, but there's, it can happen in other parts of the body, but that's where I think having that conversation to say, I want to optimize my curability, because once they show back up with metastatic disease on imaging, and we don't have the luxury of having a bladder version of PSMA PET, uh, so then what else can you offer this patient who says, I really have a good actuarial survival and I want to ensure that I don't develop recurrent disease so I, I actually think that this is remarkably uh, important data and, a, and an important discussion that our surgical oncology colleagues have to make sure they're getting with our medical oncology colleagues. Fantastic, and this is the, the importance of multi-discussion here. Very quickly, we have data with uh, uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. Ideally, this is platinum, that's my preferred option in metastatic urothelial cancer first line. GEMCIS is the most commonly used regimen in patients who have not received platinum for at least a year. There was a study about 20 years ago that showed that GEMC seems comparable to the classic older NVAC, uh, but uh, has less toxicity. It's one which we use uh, most commonly in metastatic disease setting. You know, with those dense NVAC can be used in selected patients. Uh, this is a slide that shows a plethora of phase three trials trying to uh, evaluate uh, checkpoint inhibitors and other agents in the frontline setting. From all those trials, only one has changed practice, the Javelin Bladder 100, with switch maintenance of Velumab after a, a response to stable disease to plant-based chemotherapy. So uh, that's an important slide because it gives you a, a number of a plethora of trials. And the NAL trial is ongoing. That's a chemotherapy alone versus chemotherapy plus Durvalumab, the PDL1 versus chemo plus Durva plus Tremi, and the still a 4 and PDL1 combination. This trial is ongoing. We have not seen data yet. We stay tuned. That's a Javelin Bladder 100 trial, as I mentioned before. Patients who achieve response or stable disease, no progression with platinum-based chemotherapy. Uh, they have significant overall survival, progressive survival benefit with Avelumab as switch maintenance therapy. Uh, and this can start between four and 10 weeks after the end of chemotherapy. I tend to start sooner than later in those patients. And I have a discussion a priori with them. Uh, and this is the longer follow-up here. You see significant uh, OS and PFS benefit with switch maintenance Avelumab in the frontline setting. And this was regardless of which chemo was used, gem system, carbon, number of cycles of chemo, response or stability to chemo, and duration of the treatment for interval. Uh, as I mentioned, I try to use this platinum in, in fit patients if I can. There is a plethora of uh, maintenance trials, main CAV, CAB of Elumab versus Avelumab, Preserve 3, looking at the CDK4-6 inhibitor, the Javelin Bentley, uh, uh, trying to build upon Javelin Bladder 100, looking at combinations, uh, uh, Velma plus something else, and the cohort for of trophy trial, look at Avelma plus Altitusumab. All those are ongoing right now, but Avelma maintenance is the standard of care. There is a study that we're doing together with Joshua Mix uh, called Prevail, looking at biomarkers in tumor tissue and the blood. And I want to say a couple of words about the FGFR inhibition. Neil did a great job before discussing that in the previous section, and I want to point out that FGFR3 mutations or fusions are common drivers in this disease, especially in the low-grade non-muscle based disease, and also in upper tract more than in lower tract. And erdafitinib has accelerated approval by the FDA in platinum refractory metastatic urothelial cancer if the tumor has an FGFR3 or FGFR2 activating mutation or fusion. Not amplification, but mutation or fusion. And this was a single arm phase two study. You see that on the left part of the slide. It was a, a single arm showing a response rate about 40% with erdafitinib in those tumors, platinum refractory, most of them that had uh, no uh, prior FGFR inhibition, but they had FGFR2 or 3 mutation or fusion. And we have a phase three trial ongoing. It's called Thor, and it's comparing uh, erdafitinib with pembrolizumab 
or uh, the fitness will solve as chemotherapy is ongoing. That's an option for our patients. That's why what Neil said is important, do genomic sequencing. I do it always at the time of metastatic disease in all my patients, if not earlier, to, to make sure we know the, the biology of disease and see about that option of erdafitin in the selected patients. Toxicity management is very important. Hyperphosphatemia, high phosphate level, very important to discuss with the patient. You may potentially titrate the dose based on the phosphorus level. This brings in the nutritionist, talk about diet, low phosphate diet, as well uh, if needed in higher level of phosphorus and on calcium containing binder with meals if the phosphorus is too high. And these patients have to see an ophthalmologist or optometrist at baseline and then during treatment to make sure there's no visual or uh, changes or eye toxicity. Central cells, retinopathies, fluid collection, the retina can happen in about a fifth of those patients. Uh, usually it's reversible, but close attention with the ophthalmologist and of course management of the side effects. We could discuss already importance of genomic testing. I covered this. It's very, very important to do genomic sequencing, somatic tumor testing. Germline testing is very important too. It's a separate discussion can help the family uh, cascade testing, cancer prevention. This is uh, about somatic testing, and it's very, very important. Both urology and medical oncology discuss this again, especially in the context of advanced metastatic disease. A couple of words about antibody drug conjugates, uh, and there are two of them I want you to know that because they have FDA approval. And fortimovedotin, antibody drug conjugate against nectin-4, uh, linked to a, a toxin, a chemotherapy drug called MMAE, inhibits microtubules. On the right side is Hachitusum govitikan, anti-trope 2 antibody drug conjugate. It's linked to SN38, which is a metabolantoferinotecan, a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor. So chemotherapy drugs linked to an antibody to try to go to a more targeted fashion against the urothelial cancer cells because the targets, nectin 4 trope 2 are expressed significantly in urothelial cancer cells. So it's kind of a magic bullet, so to speak, more targeted chemotherapy. That's how I call them. Very promising data, the combination of enfortmovedotin, antibody drug conjugate against nectin 4 plus Pembro is very promising. It's not approved yet, but we're watching to see what the FDA will do. We have some very interesting data from a phase 1B trial and phase 2 trial. Recently, Dr. Rosenberg showed the data at ESMO about three months ago. Response rate with a combination 65%. And as you see on the right corner, almost all patients had reduction in the tumor size with a pembrolizumab, anti-PD-1 plus, and form of that combination. Uh, we have about 76 patients. There were about three uh, toxicity-related deaths, so it requires attention. About two-thirds of the patients had treatment-related adverse events. Very, very uh, a promising combination. Keep an eye on that. Not approved today, but I think it's going to, we're not going to see what happens in the future. And there is a phase three trial comparing this combination with chemotherapy in the frontline setting. So GEMCIS or GEMCARBO versus pembro EV. Keep an eye on that. EV alone has a regular approval in the third line setting after uh, chemotherapy after checkpoint inhibition. EV has shown to prolong overall survival compared to taxane or vinflin, and he's one of the standard of cares right now in the third line setting. And Fortumab has also uh, an approval by the FDA in the second line setting in cisplatin ineligible patients. For example, you get carbogen, you have progression, cannot get available maintenance, you can go to Fortumab as an option, uh, uh, or if you had first line checkpoint inhibitor. Trophy user one, this is a trial for Sachituzuma Govitikan. Uh, top line is a multi cohort trial. Cohort one was published in JCO last year by myself, Dr. Tagawa, and others, and actually saw that Sachituzuma Govitikan, as a single agent, has an activity uh, response rate 27% in a heavily pre treated patient population with multiple lines of prior therapy, metastatic disease, and so the median duration of response about seven months. Uh, the toxicity profile is a bit different than Enfortumab. Uh, it's more neutropenia and diarrhea. Uh, this drug has accelerated approval after chemotherapy and after checkpoint inhibition. So another uh, arm momentarium option for our patients. And the phase three trial, Tropic 04, is underway. Such to Zomcovitikan versus Taxenovifilin. Stay tuned for the results probably uh, in the next year or two. And then moving forward here, I had the chance to present this data at uh, ASCO GU2022. This is a combination of Pembro plus Satituzumab. Very promising data, not approved, not practice changing. Just tells you that we try to combine antibody drug conjugates plus immunotherapy, and this data look very promising in my opinion. Toxicity is very important to manage, as I mentioned, with Enfortumab, peripheral neuropathy, high glucose, keep around glucose on those patients. About 40% of the patients had skin rash on Enfortumab. Fatigue, low appetite, taste changes can be other side effects. Very important to keep an eye. Such a dose might be a little bit different. Growth factor can reduce the chance of neutropenia, neutropenia. Sometimes if you need to do those reductions and diarrhea, 
can be uh, something to be very, very uh, carefully watch on, alopecia, fatigue, and other side effects. Uh, anti here 2 antibody drug conjugates are very important coming in the future. So not approved yet, but one promising thing I want to point out, anti here 2 antibody drug conjugates, very important as a promising tool in clinical trials in the future uh, for metastatic urothelial cancer, either as single agents or combined with immunotherapy. So very quickly, uh, uh, Neil, 69-year-old gentleman, progression of fatigue and back pain uh, after four cycles of chemotherapy, could not get Avelumab because has progression on Carbogem, liver meds, bone meds, ECOG PS1, FGFR3 activating mutation, makes you think about their dafitinib, it's FDA approved for that setting, has no immune disease, no other uh, issues, but high hemoglobin A1C, 9.2, which makes me a little bit worried about enfortumab, so a neuropathy grade one, obese patient. The question here is, do you, you know, if you, if you have a patient like this progression on Carbogem, what do you do? Do you use Pembro is an option, and Fortumab is an option, or, or uh, uh, Erdafitinib? Hard to tell. Yeah, this is a tough case. And uh, again, it just really, get, we got several questions in, 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 on the iPads about the importance of the multidisciplinary team. This is a tough one. I mean, this patient has a lot of varying comorbidities, and then really having a full understanding of these unique adverse events of interest of these different classes of medication. I think the thing that was so remarkable about your Herculean review of all of this, Petros, was that you know that one of the mantras that I have, whether it's in prostate or bladder or kidney cancer, but now even more so in bladder than it used to be, is how do we, when the patient gets his or her first shot, because typically your first shot is often the best shot, is to combine as many mechanisms, different mechanisms of action as possible, which is the beauty of all these trials that are ongoing. And I agree with you, clinical trials is a standard of care option. It's, it's not experimentation. Um, so that the, 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 the biology of the disease can be thwarted because bladder cancer, advanced bladder cancer in comparison to prostate is a much more virulent disease. So this is, this is the kind of patient that says, well, okay, you know, I've got bad disease, I've got liver lesions, I've got these comorbidities. How can you get me through this without just being nihilistic, which is really where we were five years ago? It's, it's a great point, Neil. And, and I will quickly say we just published a paper about a month ago looking at liver and mold meds, that negative prognostic factor. These patients don't do well, especially if you progress on platinum, especially with IO alone. Uh, you know, they have poor prognosis. I would say that if you want to go for response, uh, erdafitinib is an option here or in fortumab. And uh, I may preserve uh, pembrolizumab for later on, or such tuzumab later on as well. Very quickly, we have maybe a couple of minutes before we close. Neil, I, I will take the first couple of questions, and I will ask you some of the rest. So, erdafitinib use, how we make sure we receive proper testing. Very, very important point. I do next generation sequencing, tumor testing. Sometimes I do also circulating tumor DNA to look for mutations or fusions. I actually do both, tumor tissue testing and cdDNA. Generation sequencing is very important. Uh, Prevail study, stay tuned. We're going to present more data. We showed some data at ESMO on pd one expression. We're going to show you more data from the Prevail biomarker study in the future. Uh, how soon to schedule cystectomy Neil, after neoadjuvant chemotherapy or immunotherapy trials? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think it, that typically, um, you know, uh, assuming that the patient is, is to had tolerated therapy well and you're not having a problem getting it on your hospital OR schedule, uh, I'm usually hoping to do it within a three to four week window. Great, thanks, Neil. And we do the same thing at UW. We say between you know, three and three, five weeks, depending on the uh, patient's recovery and schedule. Uh, in your case that you presented, uh, it GFR was 61, I think. It was 55. Would you have the same conversation with the patient? Yeah, so um, yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, I think you know, it, it just depends upon what ultimately the chemotherapy regimen that you're going to pick, and that's where I would rely on my medical oncology colleagues to try to maybe avoid anything that was concerning for nephrotoxicity. It's a, it's a great question. You know, the different cells course exist. Some of us may feel comfortable with GFR 50 or higher with good education, hydration with the patient. Sometimes we may do cisplatin split dosing. It's very important to have the multidisciplinary collaboration, Neil, right? The multidisciplinary uh, setting, have you know, a plan ahead, you know, that simply transition patients from urology, medong, radong if needed, strong, solid relationships, 
advanced practice providers, communication with the patients, transparency, and of course, robust community outreach programs are very, very important. And maybe we can finish with a, this question, Neil. What are the key points that urologists should know when discussing the new standard of care uh, based on the, the data we just saw? So it, it is a, it's a great question. I love the, 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 the first bullet underneath, uh, establish dependable relationships. You know, there's nothing wrong uh, with reaching out to your medical specialty colleagues. It's not a sign of weakness. And I remember talking to our colleague Noah Hahn, you know, years ago when I was doing a program with him, and he said, yeah, this, all this is sort of, you know, building up my I internal medicine, you know, DNA and bona fides. There's nothing wrong with having your uh, dermatologist or your gastroenterologist or your, your pulmonologist on speed dial. It's okay. It, it's not that, you know, that you're not, you know, uh, capitulating. So I think this, this effort and, and, and having folks to help you get through this, if indeed you're having any kind of a question, is a way to offer it. We know that we have to offer these therapies in the community. Our academic centers are the model, but they, academic centers can only treat about 15 to 20 percent of the, the advanced patients in the United States, and that's probably true or all the way around the world. So we have to really embellish that. So I think that's really one of the key things. I did also want to just comment on the, the CTDNA, and I, I do think that's a very important biomarker. There's a lot of different companies that are doing that. I encourage colleagues to really learn more about that. They have approval in colorectal cancer, and I think the, the data that's going to be coming forward in bladder cancer is extremely compelling. Totally agree. Very, very promising biomarker, and I think it's really, really great to see the emergence of biomarkers in this uh, very, very difficult to treat disease, Neil. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash YEM860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from AstraZeneca, Bristol-Myers Squibb, and Janssen Biotech Incorporated, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs, LLC.